this and learning a lot more about our Savior. Learning that He's not as mellow as a lot of people have proposed Him to be, but a very stern Savior. And after recognizing that sternness, most of the time you'll see Hollywood portray Him as very, very, very meek, very, very mild. And where if you go into the book of John and study it and go back and study it again, and that's what I did, through it and back again, and uh, you're going to see that he's firm. He is firm. And, and I know that in the book of Revelation it talks about when he sets up his kingdom that he is going to be stern. And when I seen that, I, I really was looking that his word is iron. It can never be bent, and neither can he. And when I say that, there were some things in there that uh, doesn't have anything to do with us yet, but maybe it will by the time we finish. But he talked about something that was stern. And he said, if the eye has darkness in it, the whole soul is full of darkness. Now when he mentioned that, he went over to talk about something that uh, mentions if you look upon somebody in a lustful way, then you are with darkness in your eye. And that means your soul fills with darkness. If you are critical and criticize her, there's two things, and you'll learn that in the next lesson, what it means. But I, I took that when he's talking about the eye. How do we see things? He was making it very plain that what you are looking at, if it is not godly, it is not light. And therefore, darkness fills your soul. I, I was so captivated by that alone that it's made me very, very cautious in the way I'm looking at things and, and making sure that if something comes up that is ungodly in my quest as I'm looking, I make sure I abandon it immediately because you are the one that will allow the darkness in your soul. And darkness in your soul means that there's going to be a punishment within you that's going to come. And I'm saying to you and making it very plain, he said, if your eye has darkness, then your whole soul is filled with darkness. In John chapter 14, Jim was talking about that pastor preaching, but let me say something to you. He talked about this. He said and made it plain in John 1.1, 1, 1, and he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by Him, and through Him nothing was made that was made. In Him is life, and life is the, is the light of men. And then he says, the next verse, he says, and, and, I, and I love this, he said, and the darkness, the light shined into the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. Now, that's what it is today. You know, it's, it's made its way from the time Jesus uh, died for us and, and set up his ministry till now that God's light is still shining but that's why sometimes we need to go back and we need to learn to sing that little bitty song. And what is it? Let my little light shine. Well, you know something? Sometimes I think that that was the best teaching because I believe that we have a lot of Christian people that are hiding the light that God has put in them. And so you have to see now again, the eye, if it has darkness... The soul is filled with darkness. 
if you see now that God is talking about and the light of men, now you have to see, it says, in him was life, and life was the light of men. Now, if I've got darkness in me, what happens to me? Well, that's again what I'm trying to show you. I'm trying to tell you that we nonchalantly, and I watched how he dealt with some of the disciples and men and people that he dealt with like the Pharisees, and how he handled them was stern. Oh, not one of those, well, that's okay. No, 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 none of that. He was stern. He really came down hard on them. And therefore you have to see that God is intending to make us understand that this is not some little nonchalant little thing that's just going to waver and nobody's, uh, everybody's going to heaven. That's the way we sort of living in, in our Christian walk. And, and we've watered it down so much that we need to go back and we need to just study John over and over until we get the truth of what God is talking about because other things have attracted us. Now we're on page 76, how to be best friends with Jesus. And uh, we stop there on the 15th. And it's talking about here as we begin to obey him. When Jesus' words abide in us, we take on his character and pray as he would. Now underline that. Because you have to see that makes it very much the truth. When Jesus' words abide in us, we take on his character and pray as he would. Now this means our prayers must always be unselfish. When we're abiding believers, the Father is glorified through the answers to our prayers. We will also bear much fruit, thus proving ourselves to be true disciples of Jesus. Jesus then explains how much he loves us. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Since Jesus loves us as the Father loves him, we're loved to the highest possible degree. Then Jesus says, continue ye in my love. We do this by keeping his commandments. Just as Christ obeys the Father's commandments and abides in his love, this doesn't mean if we violate a commandment, God stops loving us. It means that when we keep his commandments, we abide in his loving blessing. Jesus tells us these things so we can experience one of these blessings. What is it in John 15, 11? These things have I spoken to you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. My question to you again is, how do you love? Is love a feeling or is love a choice? Well, we know it's a choice. You can choose to hate or despise somebody, or you can choose to love them. And the problem we got today in our, in our society is we decide we're going to love this group and despise this group. And when we should be basically praying for that group, the life of love produces joy. Christ had it uh, first as a result of doing the Father's will and enjoying his love. Possessional joy may be partial at first, but the goal is to be full, and that comes by learning, leaving no room for fear or dissatisfaction in your Christian life. That means very plainly that we are to have no fear in our life, no fear of exposure in our life. Sometimes Jenny will ask me about something, and I said, no, I can't do that. And, and she says, why not? And I says, well, let me explain. And I said, I don't have anything that I, right this day, exposed me. I have no fear of exposure. I mean, I know where I came from and what I did, and I've admitted it, and I've confessed it before God, and I'd confess it in front of men. I don't care. Because God has forgiven me. But when I start doing something... Just like I had, uh, had a lady, you know, uh, say to me, well, I don't want my husband to find this out. And I said, if you begin to sow deceit in your own family, Satan is jumping up and down for joy because he's going to divide your family. 
When you do things that has deceit in it and you hide it from one another, you're, you're dividing your family right off the go because you have opened the door for the devil. And that's what's wrong. See, that's what I'm talking about here. And so fear of being exposed or fear of something being found out. So we have to be very careful that we're not allowing and giving Satan a foothold. And that's what we've done so many times. We've made it easy, easy for him to destroy our families. And we have allowed that. Now, nothing can match the joy we experience when we obey Christ's command and therefore abide in the blessings of his love. So to be best friends with Jesus, abide in him, obey him, and next, love like him. Verses 12 through 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that you, sh that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whosoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. It's sad to see Christians who tear down and gossip about one another. That is a carnal Christian. That's a worldly Christian. You can have Bible teaching and still reject the commandments of our Lord. What would be one that would, uh, would go against the gossip or criti criticism towards somebody else? And it doesn't make any difference who it is. I don't care if it's Adolf Hitler or whether it's Billy Graham. I don't care whether it's Joe Biden or whether it's the greatest president we've ever had. Let me make sure you understand. The commandment was given to us to love one another as we, as he has loved us, and love our neighbor as ourselves. Joe Biden is your neighbor. Billy Graham was your neighbor. Understand that we are not abiding in the truth and we're allowing things to just destroy us because we are in charge above the commandments of God. That's why we do not obey. We do not obey His commandments because we want to get a point across and then we'll just sit back and say, Hey, I love you, Lord. But the truth of the matter is you're still on your own throne. You've not allowed God in any manner to take care of that. Most Christians' love is carnal because the love of God is not in their heart. Only the Spirit of God can produce in us a love for one another. Listen to me again carefully. You will never choose to love somebody that you don't like. So I hear a prayer from a man of many years ago, and he had a problem. And then that problem was, he said, Lord, I cannot love that person. So I'm praying that you will love him through me. Love him through me. Let the love of God abide in me that I can love this person. Well, he was struggling and he was trying. And God sees the effort and that's what we have to do. You see, the Christian life is obeying God's commandments, not your old nature. And that old nature is always going to make you a... A critic, it's going to make you an angry critic, and it's going to always be that way towards someone. And that disobeys God's law. And what is that? He said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. That's still in John chapter 14. If you love me, you'll obey my commandment. And what is that commandment? To love one another as I have loved you. Boy, we fall short. Do we ever, and I'm telling you with all my heart as your pastor, I cannot make you do anything, but you need to actually examine yourself 
to see if you are obeying God's commandments. I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments, even though that falls in there. But I'm telling you that there's a simple, simple, that we just make a choice. There's that choice of love again. I don't choose to love that person because I don't like that person. And I'm telling you that God is making it plain. If you love me, now he goes on to say, and if you love me, you love the Father also. And you're going to find out that we have, now I'm going to, I'm going to mention this in the next lesson, but I'm going to give you a little taste of it now. I don't think you can show me anything except an atheist and an agnostic that don't believe in God. Think about that, what I just said. They think about God and they, they'll do everything they can to, uh, to oh, I, I, I did a good job, I, I helped this poor person, I did that. Why are they doing that? Knowing it don't spell diddle, but it does to them, they think that that's a way to God because they're ignorant of God's Word. But you mentioned Jesus Christ and they hate Him. They love the Father, but they don't love the Son. I got news for you. You know what the Father says? If you don't love my Son, you can't love me. I'll go back and give you Jesus' words. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. And so here we go back again. He said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. We are failing to obey Him, and that means if we don't obey Him, we're not obeying the one who sent Him. And that's in the book of John. Making that very, very plain. And God is making that plain to each one of us. So we begin to see all these things that are occurring. So Jesus expresses it like this. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now I got news for you here. You may call him friend, but he called you friend first. You were never his friend if you were a sinner. And you're not his friend now if you disobey his commandments. That is a hard thing to do. But let me tell you something. I'm going to make it plain and show you that it is not that hard. And if you surrender yourself to God... The Spirit of God will make that happen and He will show you how to love those that you can't love. you no longer become a critic and you'll never be one of those that says, I hate this person. Hate will not be in your heart for the simple reason that the Holy Spirit and hate can't dwell in the same house. And so the Holy Spirit is going to come into your heart and is going to change it and going to make it humble that you may learn to love those that you didn't think you could. Now, we will probably never be asked to lay down our lives for others, but we can show our love by living for others. This means we take time out of our busy lives to listen to, encourage, write, call, or visit others. If we love as Jesus commands, what does he say about us in John verse 14? You know, friendship with Jesus, now it's not like a carnal friendship. Friendship with Jesus does not eliminate the necessity to obey. You say, oh, well, no, I want you to listen to me. Look up here. You know what? Men will say to me, well, preacher, no, 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 preacher. Me and the man upstairs has got an understanding. He understands. Uh, me and God, we got an understanding. Uh, he's my friend. That does not eliminate the call to be obedient and become a sinner who has brought God down on his level because I say that's not the God I worship. Well, you need to read your Bible, preacher. And you know something? 
You will never convince those who don't want to be convinced. You know why? There's a thing that starts with a P. It's called pride. They do not want to be proven wrong. But that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because of their soul. But they don't see it in that manner. Now this is because he wants us to obey him out of love, not duty, obligation, or fear. Jesus wants us to come to Bible study and worship services because we love him, Sam. He wants us to come to worship. And I'm aggravating Sam. He wants us to give our tithes, offerings, because we love Him. He wants us to live for others because we love Him. Jesus explains henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servants knoweth not what His word, His Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all that things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Now He's talking to His disciples. He's on to, listen to me, He's dodging, and I want you to get the picture, he's dodging the Pharisees' soldiers. He's in this tunnel, to that tunnel, to this walkway, to that alleyway, and they're looking to see. And while they're stopped, he's teaching them. They're on their way to Gethsemane, and he's teaching them. So 15 and 16 is, this is when he's left the upper room, Till he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's teaching them, knowing that the time is short, and he's pouring it out to them. He's pouring it out. He said, you know, for all that things that I have heard of my Father have made known unto you. And he's bringing up, you're not servants. Now why did he say that? Well, he had just got through proving to them in the upper room. He girded himself with a towel, washed their feet, dried them, and he said, you know, uh, the Son of Man has come to serve not to be served. Well, right then and there, they said, you know, we don't understand this. And he said, well, you must do this to one another. Well, they missed it again. So they said, well, we'll be servants. Well, he's turning around now, and he's telling them something, and he said, you know, I don't call you servants. I call you friends. Now, why did he contradict that? Well, he didn't. He's telling us that we need to serve other people. And make sure that our demeanor is not critical or criticizing, angry with, and those particular things so we can win people to come to Jesus. You're going to see today that the modern church, it has all kinds of devices to try to attract, now get this, attract the world to come in to the church. Because they want to get the, they want to get the world saved. Listen to me. That is not your job. That is not your job. Your job is to witness of who Christ is and what he's done for you and that he can make sure that they have eternal life if they believe in him and turn from their sins. No, 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 no. God never sent this church to bring the world to be won over by the church. And so the church in itself turns around and dives right in to the world and they bring who does the convicting. Well, it ain't the Christian that does the convicting. That's how the, that's how the world is now beginning to fill up the churches and the church is now beginning to look like the world because the convicting was not on the part of the Christian to the world, but on the world to the church. And it's happening. It's happening, and it's just happening big. He said a servant, literally a slave, does what he or she is told without any explanation. However, a lord or master explains his plans and purpose to his best friends. Jesus says, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. Now, he's still walking when he's talking about this. So what did Jesus choose and appoint us to do in John 15, 16? You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you 
that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that for whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. You know, we're his friends. Uh, we're the friends of Jesus if we do whatever he's commanded us. If you don't do as he commands us to do, you're not his friend. Now, the doctrine of election is a wonderful thing here. Lord, I'm your child, therefore I'm your responsibility. That's my friend is trusting God. Now, I made this note here to let you understand something. And he made this plain. We are the friends of Jesus if we do whatsoever he commanded. Okay, I'm going to stop right here and pick on Kay. Kay has a friend named Diane. They don't always see eye to eye. But they're still friends. Now, most people are saying, well, we don't see eye to eye. I don't see how we can be friends because we're not compatible to be friends. Well, friendship doesn't have to be with compatible with the world, the carnal friendship. But to be friends with Christ, that compatibility is required because we're to be like him. He calls us friends, and we're, he's not to be like us. We are to be like him. You say, well, that, that seems to be one-sided. Amen. And it'll always be there. Why? Because the sternness of Christ says, I call you friends. If you're my friend, you'll keep my commandments. And one of those prime commandments is what? Love one another as I've loved you. Love one another. Can, can you tell me in here that there's a person in this room right now that doesn't have one person in their life that they don't like and they, they don't love? No. That's the church. That's what the church is doing. That's exactly the truth. And, and you say, well, since it's that way with everybody, it, it, you know, it, it's going to be all right. Not so. Not so. Because if you, if you do not follow the Christ, you will not follow the Father. And if you disrespect Jesus, you disrespect the Father. And the way we disrespect is disobedience. And we need to be careful what we have done. Jesus says, You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you. What did Jesus choose to point us to do in uh, verse 16? Who's got that? Huh? I want you to read it again. Uh, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should be made, that whatever you ask the Father, in my name, he may give you. All right. Now, what George has read, if you have that in your Bible, circle appointed. Circle the word appointed. Why? He said, I have appointed you. Now, the other word for appointed is, I have commanded you. Are you getting what I, the understanding of that? Read it again, George. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father, in my name, he may give you. Appointed. We're appointed to bear much fruit. How many people have we led to the Lord? How many people have you led to the Lord? Think about it. It's God telling us what we're supposed to do. Now there's an old saying, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Now Jesus chose and appointed us to go and bear fruit. The word go makes it clear this fruit is in addition to the fruit of the Spirit that must be produced first and does not require us to go anywhere except church and Bible study. So what does Jesus command us to, do, to go do in Matthew 28, 19? Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
Baptism by water in the name of the Trinity has been practiced by the church from its beginning. Immersion, not sprinkling. Even Paul was not sent to baptize. He practiced this rite of the early church. 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 17. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Christopher and Gary. Lest anyone should say that I have baptized in my own name. Yet I also baptized the household of Stephon because I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize them to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, let the cross of Christ be made of no effect. When this is given over, you're going to see a lot of times that uh, just like this last baptism we had was Jamie Lynn. And who baptized her? Her father. Well, I'm trying to tell you that any lay person, especially deacon, that are right with God can go in there. The pastor can say the words and, and everything, but that person can take part in the baptism. Now, that's, there's still we still have some young people in our church that's not been baptized because they haven't made a decision. Now, let me warn you. Don't nobody provoke those children to do anything. Make sure that it's their choice. And if they need to talk to you about that, be an ear to listen. Because this is something you don't force on your children. And you don't force it on anybody else's children. But one of the greatest, and I say this with love, one of the greatest privileges that you have would be to baptize your own child. And, and it's not, we, we've gotten down to old timey, oh, the preacher's got to do the baptism. Uh, uh, right here, what Jim just got through reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 14 through 17, what does he say? He said, I don't baptize. I've come to preach the gospel. And he makes that very plain. Why? Well, because one of the things that you can see here is it can easily become a prideful matter. You know what the churches would do? Used to have the thing in the corner, and it had offerings and attendance and all that. Amen? Y'all remember that? They had how many Bibles was brought to, didn't they? Huh? Yeah. And then they say, how many's baptized? We well, see the old ones would put down the baptisms. And so one church would say to the other, well, how many of y'all baptized? And so oh, we had five, all oh, we had 15. But now I want to go back and say something here, and I don't know who all is listening, but I'm saying it out of truth and love. <clears throat> Rodney, Keith, and David, they went around with that cube, and there was about 20-some people that confessed. And they brought them up to the church and baptized them, and then they went back out. And my question was this. Well, how many of them came to church? And David said, none. I said, do you think you really led them to the Lord? He said, well, I don't know, but they didn't show up, so possibly, probably not. You see, what I'm trying to get a point to you is, it's easy because some people have never understood baptism is not salvation. Baptism is a statement of who Christ is in your life. And that statement comes up to a wedding ring. You are married to Jesus Christ. That's what baptism is. And so you, you make sure that publicly you are baptized. Now, you have to go back now and see some of the theological adverse things that are added, which is baby baptism. Well, that baby was baptized. You know what happens next? Well, that, that baby never had to make a profession of faith or nothing. They're saved because they were baptized when there was a baby. Mama took care of it. And you know what happened? You say, well, preacher, you know that's wrong. Well, let me tell you how wrong it is. Because it goes on over and somebody, that child grows up and he says, George, you don't have to do all that. Just get baptized. That's all you need to do if you want to go to heaven. And you know what happens? 
people begin to believe that baptism is salvation. Now you're going to say, preacher, you know what you're talking about? You better believe I do. And they're baptized and believe they are saved. I'd like to ask you this. I'm not criticizing Rodney and David. But how many of those 22 people are not in church because they didn't come back, they didn't go to church. But how many of them believe that they're saved? Probably every single one of them. You got what I'm saying to you? Do you see how easy it is to deceive? And that's exactly what I'm talking about here. All right. Let's drop down to where it says Jesus again. Jesus again says that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. It really says he will give it to you. Jesus has already said this at least three times. Now why does he repeat it a fourth time? I think he knows we all have a tendency to become lax in our prayer lives. I know I do. Jesus sums up his teaching by saying, These things I command you, that you love one another. Now how do we know if we are obeying this commandment? Well, there are two ways. First, pray for others. But for what specifically are we to pray? A great model or example is Colossians 1.9. Write it below. Pray that they be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Jesus said to the religious leaders of His day, You're your father of the devil. John 8, 44. Then he said in Matthew 23, 33, ye, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. You know, John the Baptist did the same thing. He said their father was the devil and their mother a snake. Now that's what he's referring to here. We have Christian Gnostics today. They live by their opinion about God's word and not the truth. Now the problem is their Bible. They live by the newscast. They live by the sportscasters. They can tell you all about politics or sports, but that their Bible study lives by. Is that what they can tell you about? When it comes to the real truth, they live by opinions because opinions is what's formed in the carnal nature. And you have to be very careful here because the carnal nature is growing in leaps and bounds in strength because of what? Because we fail to pray for others, but we don't fail to talk about some things we know. You know the best thing to talk about is Christ. Knowledge refers to both moral and biblical knowledge. Wisdom and spiritual understanding refer to the ability to properly apply knowledge. The second thing is not only pray for others, but refuse to stop loving. The first component of the fruit of the Spirit is love. What are they? Now, we got nine. We got love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness. And what's the last one I have the hardest with, or I'd be skinny and real? The first component of the fruit of the Spirit is love. The love never stops even when people hurt us disappoint us or fall into sin. So how does Proverbs 17, 17 express this fact? You know, calling Jesus a friend of mine is sentimental and it's wrong. If I said the president is my friend, I would bring him down to my level. If he says he is my friend, that brings me up to his level. That's what Christ is trying to tell you when he said... I call you friend. That's why he wants you to come to his level. He wants to raise you up. A true friend will never, ever, ever try to be greater than you are. Did you hear what I just said? I, I, I mean, this is a fact. A true friend will never try to be greater than you. And that's why you must see that in our carnal walk, we continuously have disputes because one tries to outdo the other. It's always a competition. But with Christ, he says, I call you friend. I call you friend. 
There's not a competition. Why? Because He's God. And we know it. And we don't try to outdo God. We become His friend. To be best friends with Jesus, abide in Him, obey Him, and love like Him. Well, that's 8 o'clock on the button. Lesson 17, preparing to follow Jesus. Okay. Right on the button. Okay. All right. We'll uh, start Lesson 17 <coughs> Wednesday. Won't be the new year yet. Well, no. Yeah. Okay. Any comments or questions? You know, you talked about the atheist. You know, you the other day with the and Gene. And Evan was telling about he, he does hospice work. He doesn't go to the people who are dying. His residents said to him, he said, he's not going to the door. And the guy, he's not going to know him. The guy hollered out and said, you come on in. So if you believe your Bible in the car, we'll talk about the news or whatever you want to, but I'm an atheist. I don't believe in all that. <laughs> he said, I had to go in and sit down with him. Yeah. He said, the man died two weeks later. Yep. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> My brother Jerry was visited back. Jerry died in 20, 2012. He was at the hospital when the pastors would do the visitation. And we always had to go by the chaplain's office and sign in. And that way, if they needed you, they could, you know, call and say, you know, Pastor Mabu, would you go to room so-and-so? Well, they did that to Jerry, and he went to this guy, and his name was Dewey Richards. And Dewey... Jerry walked in, and he said, well, do it. I didn't know you was in the hospital. He said, well, I heard them call your name a while ago. He said, yeah, they did. I was down there praying with a guy. I said, he's dying. And he said, well, I just called to see if you'd come up here. He said, well, let me talk to you about the Lord. He said, talk all you want to, but I don't want to hear it. He died. I had a man that I talked to, and I said, give me a moment to, to talk to you about the Lord. Will you give me that time? He said, well, next time you're in town, I said, call me. Well, I called him, and he said, ain't a good time. Well, I run into him again, and he said, uh, it just ain't a good time. I, I, you keep calling, though, and I'll let you know when it's a good time. And he said, uh, I don't know when the next time is going to be good because I've got to have some neck surgery back there. They're going to slide the disc over and do something back in there. And I said, well, we, let, let me pray with you. No, 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 just just save it to when I see you. And this is a simple procedure that very few people die, but this man died. Cut his windpipe off. And you might say, well, that was an accident. no. Just like Scott Reed went to stick his key in the door, and he is a guy that didn't want to hear about God. He didn't realize his, his footsteps were numbered. And they said, he must have hit his head. No, he died. And it's not accidents, it's provisions of God. So understand, there's only one death that is not of God. And it's in your commandments. And what is that? Thou shalt not murder. In the Hebrew, that's what it says, not kill. Thou shalt not murder. So when you see this, that means everything else. Accidents that we call them, that's like calling the drunkard this or, or calling the homosexual this. And, uh, son, it is called the provision of God whether he sends cancer to take you away, a heart attack to take you away, or a 57 Chevrolet when you're walking across the street. The provisions of God. Any more? Any other questions? Okay. 
Sam Dismith.